Hi guys. It is turning into an absolutely gorgeous, over the top, beautiful Sunday morning here in paradise. Here in this undisclosed swamp on this collapsing planet. This would be the gorgeous Sunday morning, December 13th, <clears throat> 2020. And uh, um, enjoying the signs here. Swim at your own risk. Alligators and snakes may be present. Do not feed the wildlife. <clears throat> How about warning? Help prevent the spread of water weeds. And my favorite hilarious knee slapper down here, airboat regulations. Yes, airboat regulations. No one shall operate an airboat between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. How about the airboat regulation, no one shall operate an airboat, period. But I have gotten myself in enough trouble with airboaters, so I'm going to shut up now and uh, just do what I ever do every day, and that's just check in with my email from Alert listeners and over there on the mainstream media to see how this planet has been collapsing while I've been trying to get my hip camp in business. So we're going to look at a couple of articles sent in by alert listeners from phys.org, P-H-Y-S dot org. How about <clears throat> the greening of the earth is approaching its limits and this is for anyone, any clueless moron, uh, climate change. And they're actually saying that global warming and higher CO2 emissions are good for the planet because they fertilize plants. Uh, anyway, just uh, trying to bust that myth. Um, there is no mystery about the formula. Plants need CO2, water, and nutrients in order to grow. However much the CO2 increases, if the nutrients and water do not increase in parallel, the plants will not be able to take advantage of the increase in the gas, says Professor Joseph Penelis of wherever. Uh, <clears throat> adding that the fertilizing effect of the CO2 will not last forever. <clears throat> Plants cannot grow indefinitely because there are other factors that limit them. And if the fertilizing capacity of CO2 decreases, as there will as it will, there will be strong consequences on the carbon cycle and therefore in the climate. Yes. Uh, blah, blah, blah. These unprecedented results indicate that the absorption of carbon by vegetation is now beginning to become saturated. This has very important climate implications that must be taken into account in possible climate change mitigation strategies. Nature's capacity to sequester carbon is decreasing and with it, society's dependence on future strategies to curb greenhouse gas emissions is increasing, warns Professor Penwalis. Yes, and next to that in phys.org, we have the, uh, do you really think so, uh, headline, current pace of action on climate change is unthinkable. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it is unthinkable to continue at the current pace. You know, they're talking about, the, you know, this joke 
Paris Climate Agreement, acting like it's doing a damn thing to save the planet. It is unthinkable to continue at the current pace. The global response to climate change is completely insufficient and leaves the world on a road to hell. There you go. That's according to four former senior members of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Secretariat. Uh, there you go. In reviewing 30 years since the launch of international negotiations on climate change, the team state that over over the three decades we've been you know talking about this global implementation of the ensuing commitments is failing and ramped up action is required urgently to avoid dangerous climate change and to stay within agreed temperature increase thresholds do you think so where have we heard this before? But going over to the mainstream media, we uh, get some kind of some climate change 101 under Associated Press Explainer. The real math behind this quote, net zero carbon emissions. This is the mainstream media spelling out, uh, the Associated Press spelling out all of this BS about these net zero uh, carbon emissions. More than 100 countries have announced plans to cut their greenhouse gas emissions to quote net zero in coming decades to help curb man-made climate change. The target has also been embraced by corporations, states, and cities wanting to help stop the planet from getting too hot for human human comfort. Don't forget China weighed, weighing in on this and uh, Joe Biden uh, weigh, weighing in on this. But... What exactly does net zero mean? Does it mean no more smokestacks? And is it any more than creative accounting? That is exactly what it is. It is creative accounting as zero means addition and subtraction. It will be next to impossible, no, it will be more than impossible for the world to ever wean itself off fossil fuels because they are used in products such as plastics and in aviation, meaning emissions of greenhouse gases will continue, blah, blah, blah. The math is simple for reaching net zero if you were adding to pollution, you need to subtract as much, you need to subtract as much as you're adding. And so this gets uh, into, you know, exposing this big lie that uh, all of these UN rosy predictions are relying on technologies that A, do not exist at all, do not exist at a scaled up levels to touch this problem. And although this article doesn't uh, mention it, uh, you know, that little article that appeared and then disappeared very quickly that I reported on last week that the, these carbon capture and renewal uh, what a CCR, uh, whatever that third R is, actually produce more carbon uh, emissions than they take out. Uh, there you go. I I anyway, guys, 
anybody who thinks we're going to be at net zero carbon emissions any time this century. Uh, and it also dares to point out in this article, uh, in the explainer, uh, that some governments <clears throat> have interpreted net zero to mean cutting back only on carbon dioxide emissions. Huh. Others, you know, other greenhouse gases such as methane are contributing to global warming too. And uh, all of this stuff about carbon dioxide uh, emissions are not touching the methane bomb as the UN does not factor in the methane bomb. And I'm sure nitrous oxide is not being weighed in here. Uh, it, all of it is a joke. Uh, let's see, so anybody who thinks that hydrogen is going to save the planet, turn on the mainstream media today and read this article out of The Week, simply titled correctly, The Green Hydrogen Hype. Yes, The Green Hydrogen Hype. Be careful with the green hydrogen hype, says Rochelle Toplinsky, whoever she is. It would be nice if I knew who Rochelle Toplinsky was. Quote, it will be years, according to the mysterious Rochelle, before many of these projects reach an industrial scale, and they depend heavily on the evolving technology of hydrogen production, making gray hydrogen, which is what they're calling it now, gray hydrogen, quote, currently generates more carbon emissions globally than the airlines industry. There are plans for more green hydrogen production facilities worldwide, but fewer than half of those will be available before 2035. And <clears throat> whoever Catherine Dunn is, it would be really nice if they identified who these people were, uh, some sort of hydrogen expert, Catherine Dunn, I guess. The promise of hydrogen, quote, has been repeated so often, it sometimes seems to have achieved silver bullet status. Yes, and these authors here uh, say we wrote about hydrogen-powered hybrids back in 1999. Uh, and there's a YouTube of Jack Nicholson driving a hydrogen-powered car from 1975. Uh, you know, claiming in 1975 that hydrogen was going to be fueling uh, automobiles in the next few years. Green hydrogen's prices would need to fall by 85% just to be competitive with regular hydrogen's price. It could be 2050 before green hydrogen is a major energy source. Meanwhile, though, it is already burnishing the climate-friendly reputations of plenty of politicians. There you go. Okay, what's on the New York Times mind here today? They are among the oldest living things in the world, and the climate crisis is killing them. They are what scientists call charismatic megaflora. And there are few trees anywhere in the world more charismatic than the three most famous species in California. People travel around the world simply to walk among them in wonderment. 
and of course they would be the Joshua tree, the giant sequoia, and the coast redwood. They are the three plant species in California with national parks set aside in their name for their honor and protection. Scientists already feared for their future. Then came 2020, the wildfires that burned more than 4 million acres in California this year were both historic and prophetic, foreshadowing a future of more heat, more fires, and more destruction among the victims this year and more importantly in the years to come are many of California's oldest and most majestic trees which are already in limited supply in vastly different parts of the state in unrelated ecosystems separated by hundreds of miles scientists are drawing the same conclusion if the past few years of wildfires were a statement about climate change 2020 was the exclamation point but we're going to wrap up which I could do an entire video on. We're going to go from the New York Times to the Los Angeles Times with this op-ed by some fellow. I don't know who James Pogue is, but this is what he has to say about it. Donald Trump is making a last-minute push to turn a sacred Arizona oasis into a copper pit and I've been reporting on this off and on for several years uh, about Oak Flat about Oak Flat it's about 60 miles east of Phoenix which has uh, been this sacred Apache uh, Indian site, uh, you, you know, for millennia. And besides that, the area is home to endangered ocelots, is popular with campers and climbers who have made it one of the most popular bouldering sites in North America. For centuries, <clears throat> the tribe has used the area for coming of age ceremonies. Um, its spiritual and cultural meaning <clears throat> to the Western Apache is profound. It also sits atop the most valuable copper deposit in North America, an estimated 40 billion pounds of copper worth well over $100 billion at today's prices. So today, Resolution Copper Mining, which is owned by Rio Tinto and BHP, <clears throat> two British-Australian companies, is entering what may be the final stretch of a decades-long push to gain control of the site. <clears throat> the plan by Resolution Mining is to turn this sacred area into a gaping thousand foot deep crater that would swallow Oak Flat. And the Trump administration seems to be trying to help make sure that this is done as part of a flurry of business friendly interventions in the last days of Trump's uh, presidency. Then the, what they do, and I'm going to put the link to this because this really is a uh, a, a good article uh, using uh, Oak Flats is just one little example about the war on our public lands. Uh, the saga of Oak Flat shows how none of our public lands can ever be fully safe when moneyed interests have such power in our politics. And of course, what's uh, true 
you know, here in the U.S., you can imagine, you know, I'm, I was reading this same story, uh, you know, about this national park in Brazil uh, that's getting a, a new highway rammed through it. You know, it's everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> this is federal land managed by the U.S. Forest Service. It is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and can, contains the best set of Apache historic sites ever documented. It has even been specifically protected from mining for more than a half century when President Dwight D. Eisenhower, recognizing its natural and historical significance, issued an order withdrawing it from <clears throat> mineral extraction. But Ike was not anticipating the huge power that money plays in our contemporary uh, politics. Rio Tinto spent years lobbying Congress for a bill that would give Oak Flat to them as private land, a maneuver that would circumvent Eisenhower's mineral withdrawal. And then they tell the story of how it was John McCain, it was uh, actually John McCain who did this uh, little sneaky runaround, giving, uh, you know, paving the way for resolution mining to come in there and do this. But, you know, during the Barack Obama administration, uh, they kept it. You, you know, buried, but in Trump's final days, all we can hope is that uh, is that that planet-saving Joe Biden will uh, will just you know do his own uh, update Eisenhower's uh, the threat to. Oak Flats fits a pattern of last-minute efforts. Last minute, he's been doing it since the day uh, he took office. Fits a pattern of last-minute efforts by the Trump administration to give favors to the companies that have spent decades buying influence in Washington from a push to sell off drilling rights in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to allowing new gas drilling in the area around New Mexico's Chaco Canyon, one of the most important indigenous spiritual and historical sites in the entire country. They show how the power of corporate lobbying in Washington can threaten the even places that have been protected from development for generations. <clears throat> Oak Flat can still be preserved by legislation or litigation, but it will now be much harder to save it if the Trump administration is allowed to rush the process of handing over title to the land to Rio Tinto. I guess this is some, uh, I don't know who this guy Seraglio is. He was uh, introduced earlier in this story. Quote, they want to get this land in their hands as soon as possible because when they own it, it is a different story. So James Pogue is a journalist and the author of Chosen Country, A Rebellion in the West. So anyway, I need to uh, wrap up this Sunday morning edition of today's Chronicle of the Collapse and take the little dog on a walk. You ready to go on a walk, little dog? And then we're gonna go up and uh, check out the Rainbow River. Get out there and enjoy uh, swimming at your own risk 
with the alligators and snakes and airboats while you still can. Bye, guys.